Hello all and welcome back to the Ascent Cycling Podcast for daily recap number 10 following today's stage of the Tour de France between Albertville and Valence, a sprint stage that's the number 33 for the Manx Missile Mark Haven, the Schwamble Quick Quickstep. Uh, I believe I have a, a happy Brit in the call with me. Drew, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. And even better after Cavendish's win, not only because of his 33rd win, taking him one behind Eddie Merckx, but also because it puts me into the lead of our little prediction game, which I'm I'm quite chuffed about, I can't lie. Yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly uh, happy with it. Uh, but yeah, quite a quite a, a decent stage towards the end. Uh, the first boring stage, I think we can say, yeah. like normal-ish stage of this Tour de France, a uh, stage you haven't been able to watch in its entirety, as uh, I mean, unlike the Euros, the uh, electricity was not coming home from you. Uh, but... Yeah, breakaway, echelon's attempt, and a mass sprint. A mass sprint, yeah. Like you said, very straightforward stage. The first kind of where what we expected to happen pretty much did happen, I would say. Uh, we had a few echelon attempts, some riders getting dropped. But I don't think anyone from the GC was dropped. Um, I'm not even sure if any main sprinters were dropped either. So only really kind of riders who don't need to be at the front were dropped in that in that echelon section. Uh, we did see an intermediate sprint earlier on though. Cavendish did lose some points right there. I don't think he took any of the uh, of the points available. I know Colbrelli was the first of the uh, the peloton to cross that intermediate sprint. So he gained some ground there, but it was a pretty straightforward sprint. But a, a, you have to say a lead out masterclass by Tekernik quiz there. Absolutely. I think uh, I said it on Twitter and if there's any team right now in cycling that wants to know how to sprint, they should rewatch this sprint because it was a lesson. The last six, seven kilometers from De Canuck were purely a recital of what they do and they knew exactly what to do, when to do it, with who to do it. You had Julien Lafilippa de Fontu, the world champion pace, the winner of the Ronde van Vlaanderen pace, the winner of the Omlo pace, all of that for Mark Evenich. And they have such a trust in him. I, th- I was listening to uh, Mikel Morkow at the end of the stage and he said, when I launched my sprint, I knew exactly that Mark would win. The confidence is unbelievable in this mm. team. In someone that, I mean, eight months ago, seven months ago, we thought it was maybe finished. And it's unbelievable. They put such an environment around the sprinting field and something else I'd said on Twitter and many people said it. It's understandable how someone like Marcel Kittel, Fernando Gaviria, Elia Viviani more recently struggled to find the amount of wins and the amount of uh, well, win ratio they had when they were the Wolfpack because I can't think of a single team that dominant in the sprint aspect since potentially HTC I rode and that was with Greipel and Mark Cavendish. Yeah, for sure. I think even Cavendish in his interview today said that he kind of bought magazines when he was younger and they spoke about the art of sprinting and he said that was a perfect case study today of what De Koenig did and uh, like you said, just they uh, put on a show, put on a lesson to the rest of the peloton. To be fair, they do have probably the best lead out left here after Van der Poel Merlier left for Alpesin. Um, but yeah, they were just absolutely dominant. No one got near Cavendish today. Um, and yeah, it was never in doubt. It was never in doubt. When we saw Morkow still there with 300 metres left, he kicked. And like I said, Cavendish only had 150 metres or something to the line. It was in the bag. I think everyone knew who was going to win from that point onwards. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think the rest of the competition did try. Uh, I mean, we'll take a look at um, the, the top 10. Uh, so we've got Mark Evenish winning ahead of Wout van Aert, who went for himself for the second time, I believe, on this Tour de France, uh, but gets his first podium. Jasper Philipsen joins him on the third step of said podium. Then we've got Nasser Boigny, uh, who was very badly positioned, actually managed to come back quite nicely, but tried to kick out of Cavendish's wheel at like 200 meters to go and just could not carry on. Like, he literally could not. Uh, and then wrapping up the top 10, we have Michael Matthews, Mikel Morkow, who gets uh, P6. Andre Greipel, winner in 2015, followed, uh, followed sorry, by the winner in 2018, Peter Sagan, who was my pick for the day, Anton Turgis, and Kisbol, Kisbol, who was one of the main sprinter, or actually the main sprinter, dropped in the first echelons, uh, but actually managed to come back to, uh, to get a top 10 position. One thing regarding Peter Sagan, he was very well placed, uh, but I believe he makes contact with Jasper Philipsen uh, in the build-up to the sprint and can't exactly count with his effort, but promising stuff from uh from the slovak uh he crashed early on in the tour de france but he seems to be in a he seems to be improving day in day out 
You say that, that may be the case, but he is now, I'll tell you exactly, he is on 92 points. Mark Cavendish is on 218 points in the green jersey. To be honest, I think it's gone. I think it's gone for Sagan. Um, Matthews, 159. Cobrelli, 136. So Cavendish has a massive lead right now. Um, and those guys definitely need to drop Cavendish on some upcoming sprint stages, I would suggest, if they want to wear that green jersey. But, you know, is Sagan quick enough to take a stage win, perhaps? Perhaps not in a reduced mass sprint. Um, that's his best chance, probably. But I don't think an eighth green jersey will be coming Sagan's way, that's for sure. I don't think it ever will, because we've recently learned that um, the deal is 99% done. Uh, Peter Sagan will head to Total Energy for the next three seasons. Uh, say it was fun seeing him win uh, over the past few years. <laughs> but I believe we've seen uh, well the most of what Peter Sagan could offer to, uh, to cycling. Uh, but yeah, now one rider, though, I have to be mentioned today. Sonny Corbrelli, uh, I mean, the man got P3 in Tigne. He looked to have incredible legs today. And sadly, uh, with 28k to go, De Canuck attempted a border uh, or an echelon. And well, I mean, almost immediately, Sonny Corbrelli had a puncture. Uh, and well, I mean, his comeback through the peloton was unbelievable. He was swerving that bike everywhere that that back was not going straight because mm-hmm. he put so much power on that rear wheel it was unreal i never saw a man drifting a bike in a straight line uh but he came back in the main peloton sadly i think he used too much energy mm-hmm. to properly sprint he is still p3 in the t- in the point classification and looks to me to be the closest challenger even though i know he's behind michael matthews i think probably would be the closest challenger to um to mark evanish for the green jersey but Mark's biggest opponent has and always has been, well, the mountain. And mountains are coming tomorrow. Mountains are indeed coming tomorrow. So you, actually, first, you did mention he's your closest challenger. I'm actually, uh, I think Jasper Philipson is the riders to watch in the green jersey. He's fourth place now. Um, and to be honest, I think he's rapid. And I think he might even win a stage at this tour at some point. So I'm keeping my eye on him and not ruling him out of the green jersey just yet. But like you say, mountains coming up tomorrow. So let's get into the stage 11 preview looking ahead to stage 11 it's it's the big stage because we have a double mont one two coming up i think for the first time in tour de france history the stage does conclude though after descending mont one two for the second time into malasen so it's going to be a big stage in the gc we have a couple of fourth category climbs early on we have the col de la Liguerre early on i'm going to go with it guillaume 9.3k in uh well, sorry 9.3k in length it averages seven percent it is a first cat climb so that is quite a big effort fairly early on in the day and then we have i think we climb up one two from the east first time it's 22 kilometers at five percent but really the first kind of 15k aren't particularly steep it's when we reach chalet renard that's around 15k and to that first descent that things get really steep then we descend, we cross Malisen, head back to the west side of Vontu, and then we climb the, the more typical side of Mont Vontu, I believe, from the west. 15.7k at 8.8%. It's an HD climb, of course, massive climb, but then we descend 20 kilometers into Malisen to the finish. So it's going to be a massive stage, I think, Guillaume. It will be. It will be because, I mean, sure, some, some people may be disappointed, me included, that we don't have a summit finish. Uh, some riders were actually not aware of it, uh, I.E. Pierre Roland, <laughs> who learned this morning uh, that the finish wasn't on the moment too, but in Malocène. Uh, but it's going to be a massive stage. You've mentioned the early climb, the Col de la Ligue, which is not to underestimate because it will give you a kick in the legs. And basically, you don't have any flat portion after the Col de la Ligue because you'll have a downhill towards So. Then you'll have a very, very nice run through Lavender Fields uh, in So. It's actually quite, quite a cool place. Uh, until you reach the Chalet Renard as it's more of a false flat rather than a proper mm-hmm. climb. Then the first ascension of the Mont Ventoux, I guess. Daniel Smelos and said, back to Bedouin, and then the proper, proper climb. The good thing about the Ventoux is, is that it's a climb that is both done in the legs, but mainly in your head. Um, because when you reach Chalet Renard, you see the finish constantly. So mo- like I think a lot of riders are going to try and keep that as a, as a goal to just say, all right, I don't care about how many kilometers there's left. I just care about seeing the summit. One key aspect which may play a role tomorrow is that the Mont Ventoux is very prone to having strong winds. And we have some wind expected tomorrow on the Ventoux. So that could play a, a big part. Whether we'll have a win in the peloton or a win in the breakaway, 
I'm still not so sure, uh, but we have a great, great day of cycling upon our hands tomorrow. Yeah, definitely. I think Vontu is one of the climbs for me, maybe even the climb, which is, you know, synonymous with the Tour de France. When you think mountains at the Tour, Mont Vontu, and those, that kind of colour it has with the limestone, I think, rather than any vegetation at the top, I think is, you know, it's so synonymous. And that's what I think about when I think of mountains at the Tour. And I think, Guillaume, uh, you're talking from experience when you say um, it's in the heads rather than in the legs as well. And Vontu, you've climbed it, right? It is. I have. I've climbed it three, four years ago now, and it is still to this day my best, my best cycling um, souvenir. Um, but I know how hard it is. I'm, I'm, I'm no professional, so I know like for someone like Tadej Pogacar, it'll be probably a piece of cake. Uh, but I, I know how tough it is. But I know the mental aspect is so crucial in that climb, uh, and you're gonna have fans on the side of the road encouraging the riders, whether you're P1 or P175, you will have encouragement by uh, by the fans. And that's unbelievable because we didn't have that last year. And I think that we, we missed it. But yeah, as you said earlier, the Mont Ventoux is one of the iconic climbs of the Tour de France. I think if you think of mountains on the Tour de France, the first four that can come to mind are the uh, Alpes d'Huez, Mont Ventoux, Tourmalet and Galibier. And the Mont Ventoux is extremely iconic because of the lack of vegetation. We actually call it the, ba- the bald mountain in France because it looked like someone has a bald spot. Uh, but yeah it, it's going to be fun the downhill portion though I have to say the downhill portion is quite tricky especially the start of it um, going towards Malosen there's a lot of twisty corners um, and also you could be slightly blinded by the sun in set downhill so we'll see how that goes uh, but I'm expecting quite a quite a strong day for the GC contenders but probably a break where we'll try and do something yeah, I'm with you. I think the breakaway is going to win this stage. I'll say that. I think, um, you know, I think UAE are going to be on the front by themselves. I don't think anyone else, well, I don't see why anyone else in the GC would try and relay until later on in the stage, which probably for me gives the breakaway to, uh, a chance to form in large numbers and form a large lead as well. So I think they'll win on stage 11. So I guess it is time to move on to uh, our prediction. You're now leading 3-2. Uh, am I right in saying that you've got three points thanks to the three wins of Mark Cavendish? Yep, I'm Cavendish's biggest fan right now. I've I've literally every prediction I've got right is because of him. I've predicted stage four, six, and ele- and uh, ten of Cavendish, and no others I've got correct. So uh, yeah, I, I might predict Cavendish and Bonsu, and maybe he'll win it. Let's see. Uh, I would like you to to do so if I'm being uh, honest, because that, that might be give me a chance to uh, to come back. But um, as I said, I think tomorrow we're going to have a breakaway. Um, we're going to need a strong rider that can climb, that can go downhill, and that will be motivated. There's one rider I want to say, and it's Julien Lafilippe, because winning at the Ventoux would be the thing. I'm afraid he doesn't have it yet. So I will back, just like I backed uh, Nairo Quintana in Tine, I'm going to back a Colombian to win in Malocen. Esteban Chavez to win in Malocen ahead of Warren Barguil and Jakob Fulsang. Wow. Uh, You you said riders that can go downhill, right? I did. (laughs) Okay, so it's gone Chavez. I am going for a rider you haven't mentioned, actually, to go on your podium. And uh, the Brits have been doing, doing it for me so far. And I'm going to stay with that. I'm going to go for Simon Yates to win here on stage 11 of the Tour de France. He He's hunting stages in preparation of Tokyo. Um, we've seen him in the breakaway, I think, twice on stage seven, which didn't suit him really, and stage eight as well, uh, where I think he was in the top 10. Um, but I think the weather should be not so rainy tomorrow, Guillaume. I'm not sure if you checked, but I don't think the wet weather conditions really suit Simon Yates down to a T. Um, so hopefully for my pick, it's uh, it's good weather. So, um, and yeah, I think he's got all the skills. He's pure climber, can descend fairly well. And uh, he's my pick. Okay. I'm going to make one uh, one change to my podium uh, <laughs> because I, I realized one thing. Uh, I did mention downhill portions and then I, I went for Chavez, which <laughs> is quite a quite a, a contradictory statement. So I still will go for a comment. I'll go Sergio Iguita to win tomorrow. Uh, but I like your picks. I, I completely forgot about Simon Yates. I would be com- not lying. I forgot he was on this Tour de France. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Simon Yates for you, Sergio Higuita for me. Can I make it 3-3? Are you going to pull with another lead and make it 4-2? I don't know. 
I've got a good feeling about this one. I can't lie. And just to round out my podium, I guess I'll go Fulsang seconds, who we haven't seen much of again. And uh, I'll go Nairo Man to finish third. But that, nevertheless, is going to wrap up this prediction and this daily recap of the Tour de France. We do hope you've enjoyed it. If you didn't, please do leave a like down below. Make sure that you're subscribed to the channel over on YouTube. If you're listening to your favorite platforms, then make sure to give us a like and to follow us over there as we upload daily during this Tour de France. But, Joe, do you have a final word for us following today's stage? Allez, Simon. Allez, Simon. Wow, that is a perfect French. Have an incredible day, guys. See ya.